Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're here today in three different locations uh, to talk to someone who's very special to Barb and myself. Uh, Barb, do you want to introduce who our special guest is? Yes. Well, we're here with Carissa Browning. Hi, Carissa. Hi. How are you? We're so excited. Oh, great. Wonderful. We're just so excited to have you here. I've been Cynthia and I filmed our podcast this morning, and we just waxed on uh, poetically about all the great things you do with oh. knit and crochet. And so we're so well, we're so pleased to have you here, chat with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about you know about yourself and where you get your inspirations from? And sure, uh, sure. So uh, let's see. I I I come from a math background. And particularly geometry, I, I adored geometry in junior high school. It was my favorite class, and I still I still use a lot of those concepts today. You know how different shapes fit together, different angles, and uh, you know square of the sides plus the other side equals the square of the hypotenuse, and you know that sort of thing. I absolutely still use math <laughs> every single day. Um, so my my inspirations often come from uh, mathematical concepts or like fractals and such as that, or architecture, um, fine art, M.C. Escher. Oh, I love M.C. Escher and just tessellating shapes and how different shapes fit together. And I love to explore those those sort of concepts with yarn instead of with paint <laughs> or or pen and ink or such as that. Um, let's see, I also take a lot of inspiration from just different places where you would find geometrical designs. So uh, tile work, wallpaper, um, such as that. So it's I, I like to I like to keep my designs, my stitches fairly simple. And play with the geometry and with the you know, construction, the overall shape of a project such as that. So that's that's sort of my um, where I lean to in my design work is simple projects that that have a lot of a lot of bang for your buck. You know, something that's fairly easy yeah. to execute, but but wows in the end. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know, for me, Chris, I almost see sort of architecture as well in some of your pieces, you know, like Road Warrior just reminds me with those tall vertical lines of buildings and windows and things like that. I'm so glad that you see that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I doodle something, you know, I, I have an inspiration image and I'll doodle something and it'll, it'll sort of morph, it'll evolve as I'm sketching. So the point that sometimes the inspiration isn't even apparent to me <laughs> anymore in the final project, but um, uh, but I'm glad that you that you see that. <laughs> so That's I'm great. Gonna, I'm wondering too. Can you tell us like where did you learn to knit and who taught you how to crochet, or did you learn it all on your own? Uh, let's see. Well, years ago, when my husband and I were still just dating. We went to visit his parents at one point, and his mother taught me how to do a crochet chain, and I think a single crochet as well. Uh, and my favorite part of the whole thing was was ripping it all out and starting again. So, so I have absolutely no problem if the project is not working out. I have no problem pulling it all out and starting over. That is That has never been an issue for me. Uh, so yeah, she taught me the, the very basics of crochet. And honestly, I didn't really touch it for, for a while after that, for several years. And then when my first nephew, when my brother and sister-in-law announced that, that my first nephew was on the way, I thought, you know, oh, I, I have to make something for this child. And so I, I pulled out the crochet hooks and, you know, went and grabbed some yarn from the big box craft store and started playing around and uh this was i suppose youtube existed at that point but it wasn't it wasn't like a huge library of tutorials like it is now so there was there were a lot of visits to my my physical library in in my town and uh 
and other websites, I suppose, existed as well, and books and such as that. So I taught myself some more crochet stitches, and I played around with that. And then uh, I, I would see something that I liked, and I found out that, oh, that was knitted. That wasn't crocheted. Okay, now I have to learn how to knit, too. <laughs> so I picked up more books and visited more websites and such and uh, and taught myself how to knit as well. And uh, by the time that baby was born, oh, he was decked out, I tell you. <laughs> So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, he just turned 18 last month. So so that's oh. been, you know, 18 years, 18 and a half years, I suppose, <laughs> that I've been knitting and crocheting. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think I think I saw recently on social media, Krissa, that you've also taken up spinning. Is that correct? I have just just not even a month ago i i started learning how to spin as well and i'm obsessed <laughs> i am uh so far i've only spun two skeins of yarn but the second one is markedly <laughs> better than the first <laughs> so i'm showing improvement <laughs> yes i have learned how to spin i i learned how to weave during the pandemic as well so i have a, a floor loom now that i play around with when i have time I, I cross stitch, I sew, I, if it involves yarn or string, I've probably at least tried it at some point. <laughs> oh, that's, that's excellent. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, uh, Carissa, about where you, where you are in the world and what, what, uh, what your environment is like. Are, are you known in your neighborhood as the, uh, you know, as the yarn wizard? <laughs> Um, I suppose something like that. I suppose I am a, a little bit of a, a local celebrity in my, my fiber community. Um, I, I live in the Dallas, Texas area in the U.S., so definitely a warm climate where I don't get to wear as much wool as I would like. But it is quite chilly today, luckily. Um, it's, it's rapidly declining, actually, and it's going to be barely above freezing for the next few days, so... I'm very excited to wear all of my hand-knit sweaters. Uh, but yeah, there are there are quite a few local yarn stores around here. We have the, uh, the North Texas Yarn Crawl every spring, usually in April, I believe. And um, there's probably, well, probably 12 to 15 different shops. And it covers not just the, the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, but it goes out into the the more rural parts as well. There are so many, so many awesome yarn stores nearby, and, uh, and that's fantastic. We also have the Dallas Fort Worth or DFW Fiber Fest once a year in September. So if you're coming to Texas, absolutely try try to plan your visit around DFW Fiber Fest. It's it's fantastic. We we absolutely fill up the vendor hall area and there's there's wonderful classes and vendors from all across the country and it's just it's a great time for everybody so i love to i love to spend every single day all of my free time just wandering around the vendor hall talking to people it's my favorite part is but that I will a also good probably time teach classes too what's that is that a good time of the year to come to dallas fort worth um, well, if, if you're coming from Canada, then maybe September might not be the most comfortable time of year for mm. you. It is, it is quite warm. Yes, uh, August and September are definitely warm. But don't worry, we love our air conditioning. So mm. the, building, the building is quite cool inside. So you'll find. You'll <laughs> That's great. Um, do you have... Uh, a particular yarn shop that you love to go to, Carissa? Or is it, is it, can you talk about it or you don't want to play? Oh, there, there are, like I said, there are so many that, that I love to frequent. Um, I actually just visited a new one yesterday, uh, one that opened in November, just a couple months ago. It's called Knit Dallas and it is in Dallas proper. And it's, oh, it's beautifully decorated. It's, you know, nice, clean, modern lines, but then you got the pops of color of all the yarn on the walls and the shelves and uh, 
three big seating areas so you can sit and knit or crochet or you know whatever your craft may be so it was it was a really wonderful visit that I had yesterday with the owner Meredith uh, and then on the other side of the of the metro area in Fort Worth, there's uh, West Seventh Wool and Juju Knits. Those are two of my favorite shops on the west side of of the metro. And then there are so many more as you go as you go further out. You've got uh, On the Lamb Yarn Shop in Grapevine, Texas. You've got McKinney Knittery in McKinney. Um, I. For even further out, Quixotic Fibers in Whitesboro. They're just, there are so yeah. many wonderful yarn stores. And yes, some of them are probably uh, a couple hours drive away. But mm-hmm. uh, but that's kind of, that's kind of how we live in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Everything's very spread out. That's the charm, isn't it? You know, exactly. To, yeah. And the, the whole idea too, you mentioned it about, you know, big seating areas and Yarn shops are all about creating community too, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think while I was there at Knit Dallas yesterday for maybe two hours, and I ran into three people that I know just from various fiber events, you know, DFW Fiber Fest and the Yarn Hall and everything like that, just ran into people that I know at the yarn store. <laughs> yeah. Like you do. It- how has COVID been for you, Carissa? And, and um, you know, Cynthia and I have met so many great people online on Zoom, and it feels like we're friends now, like we know each other so well. It absolutely has. Yes, it was. I, I mean, it, it was difficult, of course, staying home and, and, you know, masking and social distancing if you had to go out. But we absolutely did that. And we wanted to keep our friends and family safe, of course. So yes, I did. I did not go anywhere. I did not go to any yarn store for oh, probably two two and a half years. I did not visit any single yarn store in person for a very long time, and it was I I teared up a little bit <laughs> the first time I did. <laughs> I just walked in. It was like I got to I got to just take it all in for a minute. <laughs> So it was it was really wonderful to see people in person again and to touch yarn in person again. But I think that I think that the the new skills we acquired over the pandemic, the you know virtual uh, virtual yarn crawls and virtual classes and such as that have just they've been invaluable. And I mean that's that's where I met you two. And, and how we've become friends from that. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, I'm so thankful for technology over the past few years. Absolutely. I, I think it has a really, you know, we, we talk a lot these days about polarizing uh, things that are, you know, happening in our countries. But I think right now, you know, the this, you know, advent of online community is really helping to pull us together and to help us to share our craft a little more broadly. If you will. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Krista, do you, um, you know, I, I, when I look through your designs on Ravelry and on your website, I'm always struck by there's, there's like a pop culture reference in a lot of your uh, designs. So maybe tell us a little bit about what inspires you to, um, you know, kind of go on the, oh, I don't know, from, it's like from Sesame Street to Marvel Comics to, uh, <laughs> to, you know, popular television shows, uh, you know, how, how do you, uh, what would you like to say about, about that, about the geeky side of your, <laughs> about the geeky side? Uh, well, that, that actually started with my nephew as well. For his very first Halloween, I knitted him a little hat that looked like the dome of R2-D2 from Star Wars, and I got a white onesie, and I painted R2-D2's panels on it, so he was R2-D2 when he was like 10 months old for his first Halloween, and it was so adorable, uh, and that that R2-D2 hat pattern... Uh, it, it was a free pattern because, of course, copyright issues, and I didn't want to mess with that. So it was a free pattern, and 
so, so many people made it. And that was my first, my first little hint of, of viral, <laughs> something going viral. Uh, so that was, that was exciting. And, uh, and from there on, yes, a lot of my, uh, every year I knit or crochet or somehow make a birthday present for my brother as well. And usually they're little stuffed animals or, or toys or something like that. So one year he got a little stuffed Yoda or a uh, stuffed Pac-Man and just, you know, a lot of, a lot of the geekery is directed towards my brother, <laughs> honestly, because he appreciates it as well. And, and he, he does 3d printing and sends those my way. So we have an exchange of, of, uh, <laughs> geeky tchotchkes <laughs> lying around our house <laughs> but that's okay uh but yeah yeah uh the the very first like really big viral pattern that I had was the Wonder Woman shawl that I think sort of sort of put me on the map as as a designer and that was of course when the first Wonder Woman movie came out with Gal Gadot and just just the Wonder Woman logo was so it's so graphic, it's so striking, it's so recognizable, and yet it's very simple. It's just a couple, you know, chevron stripes that make W's. I was like, I could I could knit that. I could make something with those W's on it. And and so yeah, I sat down and I started doodling and I started swatching and you know, how do I create those those angles and the stripes coming from different directions and everything. And, uh, the Wonder Woman shawl was born and went kind of crazy <laughs> the first week that it was released. It was, it was overwhelming, but, but exciting. Uh, yeah. So yeah. And I've, I have since had, I've had patterns in the, the Star Wars knitting book from, uh, from Tannis Gray and I can't talk about it yet officially but I've got some patterns coming up in another one of her books of the of the geeky variety that I think are going to be really exciting as well so look forward to that uh later this year I believe we can we can finally start to talk about that for reals that's Um, exciting how do you find the time Carissa I, I know that you know I know that you work uh, full time at you know at a job that isn't designing or teaching. Um, so how do you how do you you know set up your schedule to give you that time to pursue your creative endeavors? Oh, honestly, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I squeeze that many hours into the day, but but I do somehow. Uh, yes, I I do work a, a forty hour a week you know normal job. I work from home, thankfully, even pre pandemic, I worked from home. So at least I don't have to commute anywhere. Uh, So that's, you know, a couple hours of my life back that I can be knitting (laughs) instead of driving. Uh, But yeah, it's obsession, I think might be the key that, (laughs) that if I am not working or sleeping, I am probably knitting or crocheting or weaving or spinning or doing something, something with yarn. Yep. Obsession. That's, that's my tip. <laughs> or maybe do you, do you find that it's an, op- an outlet for you to express yourself in a different way? Perhaps do you find Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It's no, it, it's my, it is my, my creative outlet. Absolutely. But it's also, um, <clears throat> it's a de-stressor. It calms me down if if I've had a particularly stressful day at the day job i can I can take it out on my yarn and maybe that'll affect my tension, but <laughs> it'll all block out right <laughs> <laughs> that's the theory anyway for sure <laughs> that's the theory yeah. so you've uh you've taught classes for us, and we're going to talk about that uh in a second um and one of the you know some of the feedback that I get is a that what you're teaching that you you convey it in in a way that is relaxing. Um, you've taught uh, brioche class for us. You've taught crochet classes for us. Um, coming up, we're going to be doing another session of breaking plaid. And I'm going to spotlight Barb here for a second because she's holding up um, another uh, sample of breaking plaid. Yeah. 
a beautiful scar, Cynthia, that's completely reversible. Yeah, it is gorgeous, Barb. Yeah, maybe Chris, you know, so again, these are, these are concepts, right? Like knitting concepts that we might consider to be challenging. Double knitting, you know, is, it's challenging, but you manage to explain it in a way that is um, easy to understand and to comprehend. So I'm wondering, do you, do you have uh, teaching in your background? Is that something... Uh, that you do on a regular basis or, you know, what makes you so good at it, Carissa? <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Um, I do, in a way, have teaching in my background. When I was in college, I tutored math. Uh, so I, you know, took on students that were struggling maybe in their their college algebra classes or all the way up to, to calculus and such. Uh, so my... My favorite part about teaching anything is finding different ways to say the same thing. And because we all learn differently, you know, some, you might be a visual learner, you might be a, a you know, physical learner, a kinetic learner, whatever that's called. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just finding different ways to explain the same concept, I think, is, is the key to a good teacher because not everyone not everyone's brain works the same way. So yeah. I think I think that's really the key is breaking it down into little bite-sized pieces and and explaining it in lots of different ways until something finally clicks. Yeah. So what what was kind of the inspiration behind breaking plaid? Like how mm -hmm. what what drew you to this idea of combining double knitting and marling? Uh, well, it was it was the result of a lot of swatching. I wanted to I wanted to find a way to make plaid that was reversible. So I've seen a lot of you know stranded knitting plaid, but then you look at the back and you've got the wrong color floats going across the solid colored sections of the plaid. So I wanted something yeah. that would be reversible. So I played around with with double knitting, with garter stitch, with brioche, just all sorts of things that create a reversible fabric, and how I could combine those the you know two of those things. Excuse me, how I could combine two of those things to to create a reversible plaid fabric. So that was that was how breaking plaid was born. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. So when people come to the breaking plaid class. They're going to get two hours of instruction. Um, we're going to work through a little sample, mm -hmm. and um, we're going to teach them the techniques that they need to uh, build on it. And get a copy of the pattern as well. Yeah, I'll, yes. give, you the, I'll give you to hold that up again, uh, Chris, because yes. I was hogging the spotlight there. there <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this is the uh, this is the class project for the breaking plaid class. It's a little coaster that you can see well, it really wants to uh there to right great. there so it has four white squares and one blue square on one side and then the other side is four blue and one white so it is it is reversible but the colors are the opposite on each side so this is the class project it's just a little you know coaster or maybe just a swatch if you don't want to commit to a project for class Mm -hmm. uh, but then you do also get the full breaking plaid pattern that is the original bandana cowl here that mine is buffalo plaid, black and red. And I think you can see that the black has some sparkle in it as well. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love. So it's a point in the front and then it's much thinner in the back so it's nice so it hangs on your neck like a bandana sort of uh so that's the original breaking pad pattern but the pattern does include a lot of notes for how you could modify it to create a shawl to create just a simple loop cowl without the bandana bit uh to make a scarf a blanket a dishcloth pretty much anything you want 
That's that's perfect. We love it. Uh, in fact, what Barb was holding up was actually a project that you uh, collaborated with us on for one of our uh, Christmas boxes. Uh, in uh, so we did a table runner out of it, but it's it's really you know simply, if you will, an adaptation to the pattern. Um, I know you customized it for us, but uh, it's kind of nice to know that when you buy a pattern. In like like your breaking plaid pattern that you have these options that you can you can do with it so it's exactly. not just, you know, not just learning how to do uh you know these these two knitting concepts but you're also learning how to if you go into the pattern and you look at the notes you, you, know, you can do other things with it which is really cool. yes absolutely absolutely and and it's not just limited to plaid of course i used the same i have a different sample here I used the same concept of creating, of uh, or of combining double knitting and marled garter stitch to do something with circles as well. So you can kind of you kind of tell that there are sort of uh, crescent moon shapes around the circles. So and again, this is a reversible fabric, but it kind of looks like like bubbles or like craters on the moon so this is my hypatia cowl that uses the same technique but is uh maybe a step above the breaking plaid you know the the pattern is a little less predictable a little less memorizable so it's it's not so much netflix knitting as breaking plaid can be once you get into once you get into the breaking plaid pattern it becomes uh much easier to predict have you seen people come out with variations of your breaking plaid pattern? And has there ever been things that surprise you? Um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people take the breaking plaid pattern in different directions. Um, you know, diff either different, different project types or maybe using a unique yarn. I saw oh. someone make a shawl and one of their colors was a gradient. So it was like black and red plaid at the bottom, but then as it went up, the black transitioned from black to charcoal to gray to light gray to white. So it was like a red and white check at the top, which was just Indeed. beautiful. And uh, I saw somebody else use one of their yarns was like a, um, I don't think it was a brushed surrey, but it, it was something sort of furry. So mm -hmm. their plaid had had even more texture and depth to it as well, which was just gorgeous. And it looked so, so soft and squishy. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of a nice segue into the uh, make along that we have coming up because um, we're encouraging everyone to use, you know, a different combination of yarns and to uh, choose to do either the knit version or the, uh, crochet version. I mean, Barb, do you want to kind of set this one up for us and talk a little bit about the make along that we have coming up? Well, sure. Um, Carissa, we've chosen two of our original yarns, uh, River City Yarns Hat Trick, which is our sports inspired uh, merino, superwash merino, nylon fingering weight yarn. And then we've teamed it with Adam and Eve, which is a fingering weight merino cashmere nylon blend. And we're encouraging people to go through their stash and find two fingering weight yarns and to come out and to decide whether they want to knit or crochet. And so we've, we've had a lot of really great interests. Several people have already signed up and they're so excited to try this. We're really um, encouraging the knitters to explore their crochet side. Yes. and the crocheters to do their knit side um, and we're really grateful that you're going to be coming to help us kick this off I'm very excited to be there as well and I have actually have my knitted sample right here would you would oh okay I'm sorry I thought you were going to say swatch would you encourage people to swatch was going to be my question um you you can absolutely. It's I mean it's a shawl, so yeah. gauge you could just isn't jump right isn't in. Super crucial. I think you can jump right in, especially because it starts from one corner, so right. it starts really super tiny. So you can really just 
start the pattern and once you get a, si a sizable tail that you can measure gauge, that is your gauge swatch. Right. So I, I honestly didn't gauge swatch for the <laughs> for this design at all. But this is uh this is the Visaway shawl. So it starts from it starts from one corner and you work these stripes with an increase in the middle until you get to the center. And then you actually put in a bit of waist yarn. If you've ever done an afterthought heel in a pair of socks, it's kind of like that. And then you work the second tail all the way to the other point with decreases in the middle. So it's symmetric. And then once that's finished, you come back and you remove the waist yarn and you work this square downward, a mitered square downward to the bottom point of the triangle. So wow. it ends up being a triangular shawl, but you have all of these stripes that sort of meet in the middle. And this is the This Away knitted shawl. There is also a That Away crocheted version that looks remarkably similar. So I unfortunately don't have that sample with me. It is on loan to the dyer that I used in the original sample. But uh, but it's I I just love again simple stitches like garter stitch and stripes, but an interesting construction that's still easy to achieve. It's still it's still not a difficult concept, um, but but it's unusual, and that's yeah. that's really my bread and butter. Was your sample the two skein version, Carissa? Yes. So this this did only use one skein of each color. And well, it's it's, it's bigger it's than not I thought tiny. It would be. It's a pretty decent size yeah. shawl. So yeah. Oh, it looks so pretty with the sweater you're wearing too. Oh, thank you. I have too much hair. There we go. Is there a main color in the in the in the project? Not really. Each color is used in roughly the same amounts, but the t the different sizes that you choose this uh, this sort of upside down Y in the middle that is teal in this sample in in every other size. So this is the the two skein option, which is teal in the middle. If you go a size up, the gray would be in the middle. So that is something to consider if you're very particular about what your upside down Y color is going to be, then pay attention to the pattern. And there is a note in the pattern there about which color ends up being in the middle for which sizes. So just oh, good. read carefully. <laughs> and there are four sizes, we should say, yes. in, each, uh, in each pattern, which is amazing. And the most yarn that you would need, and when we talk about two yarns, we're talking about 100 gram skeins of fingering weight yarn. So they'll have of, you know, about 350 to 400 meters, depending on what kind of yarn you've got. So the most you're going to need to make the largest size, if I got my numbers right, is about four skeins. I think that's correct. Yes. About two skeins of each color. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you, Carissa, is uh, with the crochet method, the cro or sorry, the crochet shawl, my understanding is that there's no foundation chain. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. So again, you start at the point. So you've just got, you know, a, a magic ring or just like a chain one. And then you work to the middle. And rather than the, the waist yarn that's in the knitted version, you just work a foundation of, I believe it's foundation half double crochets, foundation single crochets. Now I don't remember which stitch I used for the pattern. It's been That's a couple okay. of years. So we're encouraging yes. people to buy your pattern and to come to the knit along to find out. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, you just use you use foundation stitches rather than a chain and then working into the chain. So you don't have to you don't have to chain, you know, 76 stitches and make sure that you count that correctly and, and then you gotta work into all those chains and that's annoying. Nobody, nobody's here for that. So foundation stitches are the way to go. That's, I'm really excited about that, Carissa, because, um, and I did check the pattern and it is half double crochet. Okay. I'm really excited about that because for me, that's going to be something new, uh, foundation 
half double crochet. I've never done that before. So I'm really looking forward to trying that out. That's, this is I, I'm looking forward to you trying that out as well. And there is a, a link in the video or a link in the tutorial for a YouTube video that I made for the foundation stitches if you've never done them before. And same thing for the knitted version. There is a link in the pattern for a video tutorial for the afterthought heel method that's been adapted for this shawl. I try to do that in all of my patterns. If there's anything unusual, anything that might be a new technique for some stitchers, I try to make a little tutorial video to walk you through uh, not just you know the bare bones of the technique, but if it is important to the pattern, how that technique is applied to the pattern as well. So I try to I try to do that with every new pattern that I release to include little tutorial links in there to help you along the way. That is that is so nice. And um, I just want people to know that we're going to be doing our make along uh, three. We're going to do it by Zoom three Saturdays in February. So February 11th, February 18th and 25th. If you saw my eyes roll up there. That's because I was thinking math. Uh, adding seven. Um, <laughs> we're going to do it by Zoom and we will record it. So if you're unable to attend one of the sessions, you can you can log in later. Um, that also gives us the opportunity, perhaps if you're watching this, you know, a year from now uh, and you wanted to uh, you wanted to kind of see you want to kind of knit along or crochet along. Um, we'll have uh, we'll have some clips from those Zoom sessions that you can uh, watch a little bit later. That's again, you know, one of the nice things about doing these things by video uh, is that we're able to kind of preserve a moment in time, which is really good. Absolutely. Good. good. Well, um, I'm just going to say thank you so much, Carissa, for spending some time with us today. Um, I will put uh, notes in below the video. Uh, the show notes will be below uh, with some links to the places and uh, the patterns and all of those things that we were talking about today. Um, so again, thank you, Carissa, for being so kind to share your time with us and for inspiring us uh, and for uh, inspiring us to embrace not only our geeky side, but both our, you know, kind of by craftualness of uh, yes. and crochets. Well, thank you as always for having me. You ladies are always just, just a joy to chat with. So we'll uh, look forward to meeting up again uh, very soon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me.